Chaps, welcome back. In today's video I'm doing a tier list which I know they died out about two years ago but I thought with the fact we've got a featherweight title bout coming up I'd do a UFC featherweight tier list. So here we go. We're going to waste no time and get straight into it. Who's up first then? Ah, McGregor. Who can I annoy? <laughs> Mustard, I think. I'm going to go with Mustard, I reckon. It's quite simple. He was the best featherweight on the planet for a period of time but he didn't do enough in the division after he won the belt to be up a Benjamins. Quite straightforward reasoning really, but when he was at his absolute peak, arguably the best featherweight ever in terms of peak, he's not the best featherweight of all time, all things told, but in terms of the peak of their careers, definitely an argument there. Not going to lie to you people. McGregor's resume has got holes in it, there's always going to be a lot of what if surrounding him, but at his best at 145, he was basically unbeatable, but he didn't do it for long enough to be up a Benjamins. So I'm going to put in mustard and move on. Let's move on from Connor and move to another guy who's based around my neck of the woods, Mr. Arnold Allen. Now, I think he has the potential to be up here one day. But for now, again, I'm talking about elite fighters here. All the fighters here are elite, so he's going to be good, not great, I think. He's obviously had some great moments in the UFC. I mean, the fight with Dan Hooker in the UK was barnstorm and he was unbeaten in the UFC throughout his entire come up before he ran into Max Holloway. So I think he deserves more credit than what I'm giving him, maybe, but... Compared as the other fighters on this list, you'll see why they're elite and he's not. Now, he's still very young. He can still go on to do a lot more, and I hope he does. But for now, relative to everybody else on this list, he's good, not great. Up next, let's talk about one of my personal favourite fighters ever to watch, Mr. Jeremy Stevens. Based on intrigue, he'd be right up the top there. But in terms of actual quality, yeah, he's, he's bog standard. But again, I'll caveat it by saying he wasn't a bog standard fighter. He was very good. But compared to these guys, he's bog standard. There's a plain and simple reason as to why he holds the record for the most losses in UFC history. He was never good enough to be world champion. However, the UFC saw the value in someone like Jeremy Stevens. Somebody who would fight anybody and who will always win or lose, usually lose against high-level opponents. He would always put on a show. And you've got to respect him for that. He's one of my favourite fighters ever to watch. I'll be honest with you people. That's why I put him on the list. Because I think he deserves his respect for that. And up next is El Pantera, Yair Rodriguez. Now, simply because he's a former champion, I'm going to put him in elite. He was only an interim champion, but if you look at the featherweight weight class, because of the dominance of the likes of Aldo, Volk and Holloway, not many people have held gold in that division. There's only been six, I believe, and he's one of them. So, for that reason alone, he gets bumped up. If he hadn't have been a champion, he'd probably be in the tier below, I'll be honest. When you have a look at 145 now, I do find it quite unlikely that he's ever undisputed featherweight champion, which is a bit of a shame because technically, as a striker, he's the best in the division by a long way. He's another guy who's superb to watch and he did hold gold, so I'm going to put him in elite because, again, like I said, if you look at the people who have held any kind of gold in that division, Aldo, McGregor, Holloway, Volkanovski, Ilya, Yair Rodriguez, I can't put him any lower than elite. I can't. It might be about to get a bit controversial, people, because next up is Diego Lopez, and it may just be I'm high on him right now. It may be recency bias, but I'm going to put him in mustard. I'm not going to lie. If you don't like it, make your own tier list. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what it is about Lopez, but for me, he just embodies like an old school fighter. He looks like he's been ripped off a of Ron Jeremy set, if you catch me drift, people. I just love the way he fights. I think he's got a good chance of beating most people at 145. I know he lost to Movsar, but in his debut, short notice, arguably won as well, just saying. So, I love Lopez, I rate him, could be a future champion, I'm putting him in mustard. Again, if you don't like it, have a little YouTube channel, make your own tier list, we'll see who does better. But for now, regardless of what anybody says, is it biased? Probably, a little bit. Is it reasonably biased? Definitely. But Lopez is going in mustard, and he's staying there, because I think he's a double legend. So, let's move on. Now, I know he's only fought once in the division, but I wanted Aljo on here. And if this was the bantamweight tier list, he'd be right up the top. But for now, I'm going to kind of factor in how good he was at bantamweight. Kind of add that to what we saw against Calvin Cater. And I'm going to put him in the league. But I'm going to put him below Yair because Yair's held a belt in the division. Do you know what I mean? If I'm honest with you people, I believe Aljo's got a good chance of winning the belt up at 145. I really do. I think his control and his overall grappling style could be a real problem for a lot of the guys in this weight class. Because... If you look at the bantamweights compared compared up to the featherweights, there's so many more pure, incredible grapplers at 35 than 45. There are some decent um, grapplers at 45. He's fighting one in Evolver very soon, but I've got a good feeling about Aljo at 145. Wouldn't surprise me if I remade this in a couple of years. He's higher up, but for now, he's going in elite. My man, everybody's man, the Korean zombie, top of elite. Fuck off, Yair. 
no problems. If you do not like this man, you shouldn't be watching MMA. Go watch golf, yeah? Or bowls, whatever it's called, where you roll it on the lawn. Go watch that, all right? Works his way into the UFC. Rampages everybody on the way to a title shot against Jose Aldo. Seven second knockouts, twister submissions. Gets a horrible injury in the Aldo fight. Still trying everything to continue. Goes and does military service, comes back, earns his way to another UFC title shot. What was it, 12 years later? Legend. Absolute legend. There have been a lot of fan favourites at Featherweight. I've spoke about a few already, but Cub Swanson is another one. He's going in good, not great. I'm going to put him behind Arnold simply because I think Arnold is a better mixed martial artist. And the problem with Cub Swanson, right? I love him. Most people love him. His story's great. Seemed like a cool dude. Whenever I think of Cub Swanson, I just think of the flying knee from Aldo in the WEC, which is sad because he's done so much for the sport. I mean, the fight with Duhu Choi enough is to get him on this list and above Jeremy Stevens, let's be honest, but... What can I say about Cub Swanson that's not already been said? Like I mentioned earlier, just have a look at his story, listen to some of his interviews. The guy is a complete and utter legend. Unlucky never to fight for a UFC belt, but great in the WEC as well before even joining the promotion. One of the OGs, not only of the featherweights, but in general. The sort of mid to late 2000s into the 2010s, he was there, he was one of the guys. So yeah, a lot of love for Cub Swanson. Wish I could put him higher, but I, I can't really. Mr. Brian Ortega. Now, I used to love this bloke. I thought he was brilliant. And if a few years ago he'd be up here, but I, just, I can't now. He's pissing me off. He's going in good, not great. But above Arnold Allen and Cub Swanson, I'll give him that. I know he beat Yaya Rodriguez in a rematch. I know that. But he just seems like a shadow of his former self and he's not really that old. But he has taken some wax. The Holloway fight was nasty. The Volkanovski fight was nasty. He had that big injury in the first fight with... Um, uh, what was his name? I just forgot his name. What the fuck? Hey, Rodriguez. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a weird... Anyway, what the fuck happened there? I don't know. I think I'm losing my mind, people. But we'll carry on. We will digress. I... It's a shame. Like I said, I used to love the guy, but... I can't take a bloke seriously who looks fat at 145 and dumps fucking Tracy Cortez. You are a freak. So, enjoy your fucking good, not great, you plum. Mr. Chad Mendes. Definitely, definitely the best UFC featherweight to never hold a title. Get in the middle. Get in the fucking middle. There we go. In between Lopez and Connor, in mustard. No two ways about that. He had everything you needed to be a good MMA fighter. Great wrestling base. Very light on his feet, considering he was quite thick cut and dense. Massive power. Loved watching him. Chad had everything you needed. He had a fantastic wrestling base. He was light on his feet, even though he was a stockier guy. Massive power. The only problem he had was he was in the era of Jose Aldo. And for one reason or another, um, uh, whether it's a huge flying knee from absolutely nowhere off the back of a takedown defence, or just over five rounds, he just couldn't, just couldn't get the better of him. He was never able to beat him, which is not an insult. Many great fighters have failed to beat Jose Aldo, but then Mario Batista did, which it doesn't sit right with me, but there we go. Completely different conversation to be had maybe on a different day. But back to Chad, superb fighter. I mean, the fact he's still going now in um, BKFC and whatnot, it shows the kind of bloke he is as well. It's a shame he never held the belt. I definitely think he was good enough to hold the belt, but he was in the era of Prime Jose, and there's nothing you can really do about that. So, there you go. Here he is now. One of the ones you guys have been waiting for, Alexander Volkan. Oh, hello. What's happening here? Is he, like, freezing out after his recent KOs? Is he having a stroke? There we go. There he is. Alexander Volkanovsky. Upper Benjamins. Enough said. Like, in all honesty with you people, for a time, Alexander Volkanovsky was the most well-rounded mixed martial artist on the planet. He could take a shot, he could throw a shot, his leg kicks were brilliant, his offensive wrestling's good, his defensive uh, jiu-jitsu was great, great at getting out of subs. <sighs> it kind of hurts me to say, people, I'm not going to lie, because I do love the guy, but now that his chin is gone, it, it, it's gone. His chin has gone. Now that's the case, I don't know get really bad really really quickly worse than it already is but in terms of his legacy at, at featherweight definitely up of benjamins will he be number one you'll have to wait and keep watching to find out but he should definitely be in that top tier there's no debate about that at all i've already mentioned him earlier in the video people a former opponent of mr diego lopez mobs are everywhere now i'm going to contradict myself here and i'm going to put him there because since he beat diego lopez i've not been that impressed with him i'm not gonna lie I think he's boring. I think he doesn't look up for finishes. I just think he is what I would like to call a shithouse. A very good shithouse. 
but a shit house nonetheless. If he rematches Lopez tomorrow, he gets walloped. I've got Aljo beating him by submission because even though his offensive wrestling is very good, his defensive wrestling, uh, shit, complete and utter shite. Sounds a bit harsh, I know, but there are some fighters that I just look at and I think, you're not as good as people think you are, my friend. He's one of them. I'm sure he's a lovely guy. Uh, I'm sure he is. I bet he's a lovely bloke to sit around and talk to, but I've never spoke to him. As a mixed martial artist, as a fighter, he's boring and he's not as good as people think he is. So, he's going there. Run over. Let's move on. Ah, oh, yes, here we go. Here's the man, Mr. Jose Aldo. One of my favourites. I'm sure he's one of your favourites. He's probably one of your dad's favourites. He's been around for that bloody long. But what makes Jose so good? Well, you probably need like a, a crane or some kind of XL forklift to try and take him down. You need to literally smash him into the canvas. If you don't do that, he, you're not getting him down. He's got some of the most athletic, well-balanced takedown defence that I've ever seen. There are so many ways to explain how good Aldo was and to kind of honour him. But I think his nickname kind of does it all. In a time where Anderson Silva, Vitor Belfort, Aliota Machida, Vandele Silva, Shogun Hua, all of these legendary MMA fighters from Brazil, when they were all out and about and doing their thing, this man was the king of Rio. There's not a lot more that you can say to prove his legendary status. There was a time where he was the pound for pound best fighter on the planet, even when GSP was champion, even when Silva was champion. This guy, for a period of time, was ranked above them in the pound for pound rankings because he was that good. If you wanted to try and strike with him, he beat your leg up, take your head off. Don't try and take him down, you'll just waste your own time. Don't try and submit him, you'll waste your own bloody time. It was only when he started getting slightly older and he got chinned by Connor that holes started appearing. Before that, there was nothing. Jose Aldo is still the best featherweight of all time. Period. Similarly to Al Jermaine Sterling, another fighter who's known for their exploits in the different weight class, Frankie Edgar. And to be honest, considering how much hype there was around him moving down to 145. I'm going to put him good, not great, which I know sounds harsh, but I'll explain. After those wonderful fights against BJ Penn and he had a bit of a lightweight title reign, he then lost the belt and everyone was saying, well, he's a bit small for 145, so if he goes down, he'll dominate there as well. And he didn't. I'm trying to be as respectful as possible because Frankie Edgar is a legend in his own right and he's one of the best lightweights of all time. But if you look at the fact he fought of a featherweight gold, Twice, it may even be three times. I don't quite remember off the top of my head. I can't really tell you what his best win is off the top of my head either. And I like to do these off the top of my head and like kind of spit it off the dome because I think that's the most raw reaction to things. I can't think of a Frankie Edgar win at 145, which is a shame because there was a lot of hype around him going down. But it is what it is. Josh Emmett. Okay, where am I going to put Joshy boy? Well, I'm going to put him there. Above... Jeremy Stevens, but still bog standard because he's a bit of a one-trick pony and the one trick isn't even exactly what you think it would be. Obviously, he's a fantastic wrestler, so you'd naturally believe that his main thing is I'm going to take you down. But he's just got this right hand from hell, which has been effective. The way he chinned Bryce Mitchell and Michael Johnson, for example, was insane. But if he can't take you down and he can't chin you, if you're ranked or in any way half decent you're probably going to beat him I mean Aya Rodriguez is not a superb fantastic Miss martial artist and I would put him in elite the only reason why I did that was he won a belt the interim championship where he beat Josh Emmett and Emmett was terrible awful in that fight if you are a sloppy volume puncher or a BJJ guy who's not particularly great at getting the takedowns in order to set up the submissions Josh Emmett's probably going to catch you and knock you out. If you've got any kind of elite level skill, like even a slightest bit of championship calibre, you're going to find a way to beat Josh Emmett. I mean, look at Ilya. He completely ripped him to shreds. I know Tapuri is brilliant, but in comparison, yeah, he has to go at the bottom for me. I think this next man may be the most underrated 145 of all time, Ricardo Lamas. Again, he was in the Aldo era, and by the time Aldo had come off his pedestal, he himself had got a bit older and it kind of fell down the rankings as well. But in his prime, Ricardo Lamas is a top 10 featherweight of all time. That's why he's an elite. Because I believe if you were to put a Pete Lamas right now in the division, probably only Volkanovski, Holloway, Lopez and Ilya Tapuria beat him. For me, at least. I, I know he got chinned 
by Josh Emmett. But again, that was very, very late into his career. I remember, and I got a story for you here, only a short one. I was about 11, 10 maybe, and he fought Matt Grice on um, the Czech Congo Pat Barry card, I believe. That crazy back and forth fight with the weird ending. I was very, very young. I found it online. There was some highlights on it on YouTube somewhere. I can't remember even where it was. It may have been YouTube. It may have been somewhere else. I don't even know about them. But I remember later on that year, it was like a Halloween kind of um, dress up sort of thing. And I went as Lamas because I just love that performance. And I had the little mohawk and everything. I thought he was an absolute legend. So again, could be a bit of bias from me, but always been a big fan of Lamas. And I think he deserves a lot more recognition than he gets. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, Max Holloway's up next. He's always going to go in up a Benjamins. I'm going to put him at the back because he lost three times to Volkanovski. I know he beat Aldo twice, but Aldo's the GOAT, so whatever. And I just think prime peak Aldo, prime peak Volkanovski, prime peak Max Holloway. There were more holes in Holloway than the other two. I know he's got great takedown defence and you need a bloody half a small army to knock him out. And they, may not, they might not even be able to do it, but... Look, I'm not trying to diss Holloway here. He's had some fantastic performances. Obviously, recently, he's had Gaethje, he's had Calvin Cater. And even if you go back, he had the Aldo fights. The Anthony Pettis fight was brilliant off the top of my head. But, yeah, he's obviously worked his way into a position to fight for the title again. He's got Elliot Tapuria over the weekend. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that fight. I'll be doing a full breakdown tomorrow on the channel, Friday, 6pm. Keep your eyes peeled. But, yeah, Max Holloway is... Some people's featherweight go, and if you believe that, I'm not going to argue with you because I think the guy is an absolute legend and I love to watch him fight like we all do, but yeah, there's no doubt he's in Upper Benjamins. Nobody's arguing that, and if you do, you're bloody stupid. And of course, the only way to finish a featherweight tier list is with the current featherweight champion, Ilya Tapuria. He's going top of mustard, ahead of Connor, but below the top three. I said a minute ago that I think for a period of time, Alexander Volkanovsky was the most well-rounded fighter on the planet. I think Ilya Tapuria is the most well-rounded finisher on the planet. You hear a lot of people say, oh, he can finish you everywhere. And there are fighters who can do that. Oliveira's got power in his hands. And of course, superb uh, jiu-jitsu. Bas Rutman was one of the first guys. He was TKO and everybody. Then he learned how to grapple and he submitted everybody. There are people who can do both. I think Tapuria is the most proficient in both in the sport at the moment. And normally, if you are incredibly gifted at both knocking people out and submitting people... You would try and knock out the grappler and, and submit at the knockout artist, right? In theory. Ilya Tapuria completely battered the power puncher in Josh Emmett and submitted the grappler in Bryce Mitchell. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter where the fight is. If he's against Max Holloway, he can strike with him. If it's against, like I said, a Bryce Mitchell, even Al Jermaine Sterling, he would probably back himself on the ground. Whether he come out on top, I don't know, but you're never safe in a fight against Ilya Tapuria and... Max Holloway's 100% never been finished streak is on the line. More than it has been in pretty much any other fight he's ever had. I thought Gaethje would crack his chin. He didn't. If anybody's going to now, it'll be Tapuria. I have no doubt about that. If he beats Max Holloway, and he beats Volkanovski again, which I think will probably be his next fight, and then he beats a Diego Lopez or an Aljamain Sterling or a Movsar Evaluev, God forbid, he starts to put together a resume that could match Volkanovski's. He has to do so much if he wants to beat Jose Aldo, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but I'm high on him. I think he has the potential to do that. I really do. Right, chaps, that completes my UFC featherweight tier list. If you like my suggestions, let me know. If there's anything you would change, I'd love to have a little chit-chat down in the comments, so make sure you let me know, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.